Hello, I'm Peniel Joseph, special guest moderator for Voice of America and Norfolk State University's Town Hall, Africa to America, the Odyssey of Slavery. Slavery is inseparable from America's story, but even after 400 years, still difficult for some to discuss. But we're going to do just that for the next hour, explain how this conversation is relevant, especially for today's youth. It all began in Angola. Tropical Atlantic beaches dot its coastline. Angola looks so peaceful. But what happened here 400 years ago was not. From the shores of Angola to the shores of Virginia, Africans arrived against their will. First a few, then many human cargo traded to the early settlers. Their arrival marked a crucial turning point for an emerging colony helping transform a vast wilderness into a new world. At what cost? What is the lasting impact? We will explore the legacy of slavery and steps forward in this town hall, Africa to America, the Odyssey of Slavery. This August marks the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first Africans in colonial Virginia. Hello again. I'm Peniel Joseph, your special guest moderator and a history professor at the University of Texas. I want to acknowledge now some of our guests in the audience. Virginia Governor Ralph Northam, Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax, and Ghanaian Ambassador Barfour Bewa. The start of slavery has shaped many things in American democracy. Joining me to discuss how is a distinguished group of panelists. Dr. Cassandra Nubi Alexander is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University and a history professor. Terry Brown is the superintendent of Fort Monroe, where the Africans arrived in colonial Virginia. Dr. Amy Glock is a professor of Africana Studies at the University of California, Northridge. Dr. Robert Vinson is a professor of history and Africana Studies at William and Mary College in Williamsburg, Virginia. And Dr. Gloria Brown Marshall taught Africana Studies at Vassar College and now teaches constitutional law at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. <laughs> Well, I'm going to begin by asking you about 1619, and this is the 400th anniversary of the arrival of Africans into what becomes the United States of America. I want to have a conversation about race, democracy, and citizenship, and what does it mean that the entire country really is focused on 1619? There's a New York Times project, and one thing to remember is that black folks a lot of times start things that then people catch up on. And way before the New York Times did the 1619 project, um, Hampton, uh, uh, Norfolk State, black folks in Virginia at the grassroots have been talking about democracy and slavery and freedom right here in, in Virginia. And I want to start the conversation there, and we're, we're, we're going to start with you. Okay, I'd first like to acknowledge two friends who really helped to start Project 1619 in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, Dr. Bill Wiggins, who is a retired professor of history from Hampton University, and Mr. <laughs> and Mr. Calvin Pearson, who has, you know, really carried the flag throughout the country in 1619. And it was in 2012 that we gathered groups of people, scholars, people who are uh, community leaders together, to start having a conversation about 1619 and what that really means for American society. And so we asked the question, who are we? Who are really Americans? And that question is, is really at the foundation of 1619, because our national narrative erases people from that narrative. It erases people of color, because even though Jamestown was founded, the Jamestown colony was founded in 1607, it really wasn't until 1619, with the formation of the first limited legislative body that set up a court system that we knew that this colony would actually survive. And a month after that emergence of a legislative body, 
kidnapped Africans from the central west African coast mm -hmm. were brought here, of course, against their will. They were twice kidnapped and brought here by two ships. The first one, the White Lion, arrived in late August of 1619. Three or four days later, the treasurer arrived with probably a total of about 32 people. And I want to bring Gloria Brown Marshall in here to talk about that. Well, I want us to think about these issues, these concerns. These people kidnapped twice, stolen from their villages, brought then to the shores. They had to learn the language because Portuguese was the language that was, was spoken before and we have a representative of Angola here and I have traveled to Angola and understand that this relationship between the Angolans and the um, African Americans should be something strengthened. They had to learn the culture, the language, the economy and they did this. So we have Marion Anthony Johnson. These people own land. They had servants of their own, these Africans, in the 1600s. We have Isabella and Antonio, and of course their son, William Tucker, becomes the first African child born here. We think of ourselves as these very sophisticated people, but we need to understand they had sophisticated ways of, of cultivating land, they had farming skills, they had ways to raise animals, but for our presence in that colony, it would have struggled and perhaps died off like Roanoke. Superintendent, I want you to jump in here. Well, it's an interesting conversation because um, it's one thing to teach African American history is another to work where the Africans actually landed. Mm -hmm. And it's very emotional because I drive through a, a, a bridge every day and I think about that all the time. My office is the former home of Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let that sit for a second because <laughs> when I travel into that fort, I often think, Okay, um, the first Africans arrived here. There's a large stone fort, the largest in the United States, and that fort was built by Africans. Mm -hmm. So the same place where they were enslaved, they also gained their freedom through the contraband decision. And then you put the cherry on top and you say, okay, in 2011, President Obama would sign a document making it a national monument, at least a portion of the fort. Now, when you think about that 400-year arc, that's emotional. Mm -hmm. It's really emotional. And I'm, I'm so proud to represent this community and bring that to the nation because there's a lot of people out there that have no idea about African-American history. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ingram. Yeah, I was going to say this gives us an opportunity for a couple of things. One, to lay the foundation of what had occurred before enslavement and to set up what the continent looked like before enslavement occurred, which gives a very different picture when you're looking at the slave castles, when you look at the, the journey that African people had to take when they were being stolen and kidnapped. And so this gives us an opportunity to look at it because we look at enslavement, as it's always been said, as a disruption to African history. Right, so this idea of it being a, a space and time, a moment, to be able to give us an opportunity to back it up and look at the continent look like before, understand what enslavement has occurred, the ma'afa as we call it, and then be able to see how it lays the foundation for everything that happens today, really, when we all think about it. And then the other thing, too, is also being able to look at the various forms of resistance that have occurred because it's not just African people came to America, they were forcefully brought against their will, and they resisted every step and every moment of every day. So I think this gives us that opportunity to back it up, look at what Africa looked like, and then also bring in this notion of resistance. Briefly, Dr. Vincent. Sure. So we're talking about a beginning in a way of 1619, the beginning. But if we put it in global context, we always have to remember that the history of black people does not start with slavery, Absolutely. right? We can talk about Absolutely. our a ancient African <laughs> states. Of Egypt and Nubia and Ghana and Mali and Songhai. And we also remember that the term slave comes from Slav, Eastern European peoples. And at 1619, there were more whites enslaved in the Mediterranean, in North Africa, and in Russia than there were African, um, uh, African descendants in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so we, we always keep that context uh, of what we're talking about. And I also think about this idea of anniversary. Some people use anniversary. I like the term remembrance. Mm -hmm. I just celebrated a wedding anniversary. That was a very happy occasion. <laughs> this is a more somber, more reflective, more sober reflection. And I think of remembrance as a time to respect, remember, reflect seriously, and honor our ancestors. So that's how I think about 1619. Thank you. Now, this is a great start <laughs> to this conversation. <laughs> 
And now we're going to hear from some bright and curious nine and 10 year olds from a school in Hampton, Virginia. They have lots of questions about slavery and race relations. Some of these statues were slave owners, and it was such a horrible thing to have slavery. So, my thing is, why? That's my question, why? That's, that's my question, why? We have to know what what our history was. There was land taken from different races because they were that race. And I don't feel like any of that is right because we're all human beings. Now we're allowed to do stuff that we couldn't do before. We have to know this is why we're free and this is why we can do this. Almost two years ago in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, there was people in their cars who was running over people. Me and my family took a trip, and while we were on our way, we were driving in Charlottesville, and we had to be very careful. I've seen uh, on the news where a black man was trying to ask for directions, and he knocked on a white person's house. The husband, he went and got the gun, and chased the black man off, so I thought that might have been, well, was it because he was black, or what did they think he was trying to, like, steal something? And I thought it was really mean. Some people want to treat other people unfairly. Still, after all that's happened, people just don't get treated the way that they deserve. They just get treated very wrong. Sometimes people think that it's still right to keep people separated. It's like it's happening again and people are starting working it up again. Black males and females that are getting shot, people are losing their lives and they haven't done anything. So I think we can improve that. We live in the United States. United means that we're all in this together. But people aren't getting treated fairly because it's, because people are not doing the right thing. And we should all do the right thing because we're in this together. Reparations. There's been a lot of talk about paying the descendants of enslaved Africans for more than 200 years of harsh labor. Um, when we think about this idea of reparations, uh, how, how did the, we ask them, <laughs> excuse me, should descendants of slaves get reparations? We asked some people walking near the Washington Monument for their opinion. The United States owes a great debt to the descendants of slaves. It's hard to say that those people should get reparations when they weren't themselves a part of that. There's just going to be a big argument of who deserves the money, where is it coming from. Our economy was built off of the labor of slaves and everything we have now really is based on that. I think it'd be good to look into. I think it's a good idea. Trying to fund it, trying to find who is, who isn't, shouldn't get it, it was a hard thing to do. I don't think that uh, tracing back to slavery should be a requirement because uh, every African American faces racism and bias in this country. The slavery was terrible, but that was a, a long time ago. So we got rid of slavery. And so that wasn't good enough. So then we got, they got the vote. Oh, that was good. And then that wasn't good enough. 
in Ireland there's one tribe, in Sweden there's another tribe. Here we have multiple tribes. And considering that, we do really, really well. Okay, we have five minutes, and that's a brief amount of time, to talk about reparations. And not just this cash check, but reparations that's connected to the young children we saw, about a healing of wounds. Um, I'm going to start with Gloria Brown Marshall. Reparations. Well, briefly, why should we be having this national conversation about reparations? First and foremost, we built this country on land stolen from the Native Americans, and now we have had this conversation about reparations that starts and stops since slavery ended, and there's always some politically expedient reason we shouldn't have the conversation. That bondage picture right there displays us as we are tied down, but does not talk about all we've contributed to this nation and had to go through 400 years of perseverance. A Truth and Reconciliation Commission is needed to first acknowledge the sins of the past, and through saying COFA understand our past to get to the present situation to better understand where we're going in the future of this country or there could be continued racial conflict and we'll never heal. Professor Vincent. Absolutely we need to talk about reparations and I'm so glad that we're having this conversation. When we look at the racial gap in terms of wealth, on average the black family has four percent of the wealth of an average white family. When we look at health disparities, educational disparities that are caught across racial lines, that is the result of intergenerational mm -hmm. wealth gap and accumulation. And when we talk about slavery, we can't talk about it just as an evil. That's one thing. But we also have to talk about it as theft. The theft of people's labor and the largest slave society in world history, four million people by 1860. The theft of that labor for 246 years for the benefit of others, even for those who did not directly own enslaved people, that's an accumulated debt that continued in the Jim Crow era, showed up in government housing policies, redlining, segregation, the whole nine yards. There's a material dispossession that we're still living with that has accumulated over generations, that's structural, that's systemic, and we need a solution that acknowledges and addresses those structural and systemic gaps. Dean. Thank you. Uh, America has what many legal scholars call a muscle memory. And because the foundations of our legal society rested in racial differences, there was a racialism that was put into law very, very early on, from the first moment that those Africans stepped ashore on, in the Virginia colony. And because of that, we have never excised that racialism from our law, from our society, from our culture, from our economic and social and cultural practices. So reparations doesn't just mean give somebody money. Reparations has to do with an overhaul to right a wrong. So we talk about equality, but we don't talk about equity. And equity is not, has not been addressed. And so reparations must start with equity first. And so when we talk about, well, we can't find the descendants. African Americans are the descendants, and there are some white people in this country who are also the descendants of enslaved people. And so the idea is let us begin with equity and let's right that particular wrong, and most importantly, let's begin to rewrite our narrative so that it is historically accurate, it is grounded in facts, and it is not about power, it's about truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. As, as, somebody, as somebody who's descended from, from, from Haitians, I can, I can tell you that ha Haitians are connected to this reparations <laughs> and, and, and slavery debate as well. Uh, Dr. Ng. Well, and it's not just the theft, it's also the continued theft of America uh, to, of black people, right? So it's a continual process, not just, it didn't just stop, right? Mm -hmm. It continues to go. 
But the idea of, in addition to the overhaul and even thinking about how one spiritually heals and mentally heals from enslavement over generations, but also thinking about if it is going to be monetary in some capacity, then where does that money go to? And there's been a lot of suggestions about investing in black-owned businesses and black schools and like black neighborhoods to try to really set things up in a more equitable type of, of, of idea. But for sure it has to come in a variety of different ways, but it's this continued theft that America keeps taking from black people over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And there's no debt. I mean, America can apologize all they want, but what's, what's attached to it? There's nothing. Mm -hmm. right. Superintendent. Well, the point I would make is that the American economy was produced by slave-grown crops, like cotton, sugar, tobacco. Those crops were sold to international markets to bring capital back to the colonies. The capital was used to build infrastructure that created a massive wealth for this country for three centuries. Now, let me give you some interesting information. In 1860, there were four million slaves in this country, and they were valued at $3 billion. That's seven times more than the banks, all the railroads, 47 times more than the expenditures of the federal government. The first eight or nine presidents were slaveholders. Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, <laughs> all the way to Tyler, Polk, and so forth. And all the chief justices were slave owners. Mm -hmm. John Marshall, Roger Taney. Mm -hmm. It breaks my heart. I'll just stop right there. <laughs> when we think about I, I want to uh, briefly, with the time we have left, to, to, to tell the audience and everybody who's watching this, this relationship between slavery and capitalism. Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes we, we think, and contemporary, we saw in the video, there's some whites who say, look, my, my family didn't own any enslaved Africans, so what do I have to do with this? And, and the fact that slavery sets up these racial hierarchies and this racial caste system and white supremacy, white privilege, sometimes we call white, white fragility, right? I, I want us to talk about slavery and capitalism and what we could do right now. Sandy Darity and some other professors and scholars, and of course there's been in Cobra and, and um, Mary Frances Berry has talked about Callie House and has the great mm -hmm. book, My Face is Black, My mm -hmm. Face is True. We've been talking about getting pensions and reparations, um, but, but what shape would it take and, and there's new work looking at how black people's lands have historically been stolen out from under, under them um, by the billions. I'll start with you, Gloria. Very quickly, everybody tell me, what would your one silver bullet be, reparations? In, in my book, Race, Law, and American Society, I look at property. Property and education, those two. Scholarships, free um, tuition to whatever colleges we want to attend, as we had with the GI Bill after World War II, as well as getting our property back, but stopping the legal rape of black people through fines, through imprisonment, through the prison industrial okay, that's complex. Good. That's good. Everybody, that's good. I want everybody to be that sure. Thank you, Dr. That's good. I'm a historian, so I'm going to speak to history. I think we need to have a broad collective understanding of what actually happened in the past and how that past impacts on the present to create those racial disparities that we've talked about. That's the first step. Can we all have a broad collective understanding of what happened and where we are now? And then we can move forward thinking about how specifically to address those disparities in all the areas that we're speaking of, land, economics, housing, education, Healthcare. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Overhaul of the white supremacist and racist structures that are currently, that we have today because of enslavement. Okay, thank you. Superintendent. Well, I think we need financial literacy. We need to learn how to create legacies for our communities. Um, in my lifetime, racism has never disappeared, so we need to work on building our communities and you start financially. If you give me $10,000 today and you sit it in a bank for 40 years, I can create a legacy for my community. Thank you. So Thank I'm you. just going to say it in an example. Here we are at Norfolk State University. It's a historically black college and university, and shout out to Norfolk State. Norfolk State. <laughs> Norfolk State began in 1935, um, and it continues today strong. But Norfolk State was underfunded, legally underfunded, or I should say, non-legally, under, illegally, <laughs> underfunded for 75 years. And then, they, and then the state 
um, settled that 75 years of underfunding mm -hmm. with a tiny little bit of money. Mm -hmm. That is not mm -hmm. equity. And, and yet we're supposed to compete with everyone else that did not experience mm -hmm. that systemic inequality. Okay. And so that is what we're facing. That's, that is where reparations needs to begin. It needs to begin with equalizing where we are and addressing the past wrongs. Thank you. Thank you. In the U.S., some may describe the relationship between Africans and African Americans as a strong and historical one. What are the common bonds? What are the differences? We asked some Africans and African Americans living near the nation's capital for their thoughts. I don't see any cultural differences because what I know is that all of what come from Africa, you want to follow the history. They think that, you know, we don't take advantage of the things that we were afforded here, that we're not working hard enough. Some of them see those that are coming from Africa like if they are inferior, of the, uh, inferior about them. American-born African-Americans, we don't have a clue as to where we've come from. We don't have that benefit of having our culture, our food, and our uh, customs and things, whereas the people who are coming directly from African countries do. Those who are born here need to see those who are coming from Africa like their siblings. They need to learn the history of America. Um, they need to learn, and it is not just black history, it is our history of America. The rights, the women's match, the black power, everything has actually really helped us and we've gained a lot from them. So it's going to be more synergy, we just got to find the common ground. Music may be the common ground. Footballs that come bring us together, games. We all come together. We should all be one united family in the United States of America. Okay, um, I want to open up this conversation to talk about not just the relationship between Africa and African Americans, but we are global people. Like I said, my people are from Haiti, the, the DR, other places. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the relationship Africa, obviously, African Americans, but also that global diaspora. We have people from Brazil, the Americas, where my people are from, the Caribbean, which really had the most enslaved Africans. When we think about both the, the Americas and Latin America, South America, Brazil had the most. So what is that relationship now? Because I study the black power movement and, and, and um, anti-colonial movements, pan-African movements. There was a point where that relationship was wonderful and it flourished. And I think about uh, people like Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Touré, um, Malcolm X going to Africa. I think about uh, Sekou Touré, Azi Kiwe, um, all these different leaders, uh, Kwame Nkrumah. And we've got Angolans and, and different um, African folks here. What, what has happened to that relationship? Why has it become much more complicated? And we can see some of those complications from, from um, what we just saw there. I'm going to start with you, Dean. Um, I think the reason it's more complicated is because after segregation in this country officially ended um, and w as we went through the 1970s and we started to see the removal of at least the visual signs of this inequality and separation, there was a sense among many African Americans that we had arrived. Mm -hmm. We didn't need to keep pushing black history. We didn't need to keep seeing ourselves as part of a diaspora, as part of a global community. And I think that that there was a shift and there were also political obstacles that were put in place for many uh, people of African descent. We lost in so many ways these centers of protest. Mm -hmm. uh, when apartheid finally fell in South Africa uh, because so many African Americans were behind the end of apartheid, it seems as if we felt like, okay, the world has now arrived. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the information coming out to talk about these inequalities, such as what is happening in the Dominican Republic with the people they call Haitians, mm -hmm. who are Dominicans, but because of, of a color difference, they're seen as different people who should be ousted from that country. And so that information is not a part of our national uh, thoughts because it's not in the national news. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of what used to be pushed through the black press mm -hmm. 
is now diffused and most people aren't even subscribers to the black press so they don't know what's happening mm -hmm. so there needs to be a galvanizing effort to push that information out okay thank you professor brown marshall um, I've traveled to Angola this past April. I've been to Ghana. I went to graduate school for a short time at University of Ibadan in Nigeria. I've been to other countries as well. And my major concern is the European, I was an exchange scholar in, in England, learned divide and conquer successfully and has been using it over many, many centuries. And that is what we're seeing here, to make the African more exotic. You know, someone who then they can say, we think you're the best in, in, um, of the black people. We're gonna focus on you and give you the scholarships and you the opportunities. Because African Americans remind Americans, white Americans, of their history. And they remind white Americans of the original sin. And so if they can find a way to continue to marginalize the African-American voice, the African-American economy, and so that they can say it's not that we're anti-black because we like those people from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. We like those people from Africa. You, African-American, you have too much of an edge. You're too angry. Mm -hmm. And if you're coming into this country without having a sense of how this house was built, yeah. we built it. And so I think a lot of African Americans are looking at people from the Caribbean and from Africa and saying, do you not understand the price we paid for you to come into this country as you have and take advantage of what's here? One thing that I'm going to go to, to Professor Vincent, one thing I would, I would add um, and, and contextualize those remarks is, is that we, we also have a rich and deep Pan-African understanding yes. in history. When we think about Marcus Garvey and Hubert Harrison and Amy Jack Garvey and, and all these different people who've got Caribbean and African roots, and certainly Norfolk State University, Howard University, mm -hmm. historically black colleges have been the roots of, of uh, anti-colonialism and the freedom that Nelson Mandela and other people had because we accepted Caribbean and African students at times even when their own countries um, wouldn't, wouldn't accept them. So it's very important uh, mm -hmm. to remember that as well. Uh, Absolutely. That's exactly where I was going is that in 1903, W.B. Du Bois speaks of a global color line. And that dynamic of a global color line spoke to the fact of colonialism in Africa and other parts of the black world to legalize Jim Crow in this country. So that was a starting point to have a broad, broadly shared sense of identity and a willingness for collective action. It began a conversation. Now those structures of legal colonialism and legal Jim Crow are not there, although we are still dealing with global white supremacy. Mm -hmm. It's a little sometimes harder as it shape shifts to figure out exactly what it is and how it's hitting you at a certain point. But I think it's still there. And I think the way that we, as children of the diaspora and as Africans, we need to know more about each other and our specific mm -hmm. histories. So for many um, um, Africans or, or Afro-Caribbeans coming to the United States, they may not be fully aware of this history of Jim Crow, et cetera, and, and how we have come to this point. Likewise, African Americans are not always very familiar with Africans. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know languages or customs. Mm -hmm. And so while we have a sh broadly shared sense of collective understanding and, and a history of collective mobilization, we still need to do the hard everyday work, person to person, of getting to know each other, our histories, our cultures that are, that are specific, so that we see our humanity and respect each other's differences, even as we have these broadly shared similarities. That, I think, will take us forward. Mm -hmm. People of European, yeah, very good. Uh, people of European descent embrace white supremacy and know very well that if African people throughout the entire world unite together, that they will overthrow global white supremacy. So the idea is, is to dismantle that every step of every day. And how do you do that? Mm -hmm. The media is a huge piece of that. Right? Not only does it per perpetuate in misinformation, as you were saying, with African people about African Americans and African people with African Americans, but then it plays on those misinterpretations and, this more, and misorientations. So then there's so many misunderstandings that it's really hard to get people into the same room. Right. So the media is a key component of white supremacy, global white supremacy, to try to make sure that there is not that connection. Because that connection is there and it can be there. You just have to get through the media in order to get there. I don't think I have anything to say. <laughs> that was well said. Well, was I, I want to I wanna, um, continue and expand because I think one of the things when we think about the relationship between Africa, the Caribbean, and African Americans is the, is the complexity that 
all people within that relationship find themselves in, mm -hmm. especially in the post-colonial, or we might say neo-colonial mm -hmm. landscape sure. of Africa. But also, when we think about, I wouldn't call it a post-civil rights or post-black power, but certainly it's a, um, it's a white supremacist American mm -hmm. um, historical context that we find ourselves in now. Uh, Rayford Logan called the late 19th century the nadir of black mm -hmm. history. Um, we, we could say there's a new nadir <laughs> When we, when, we, when we think about uh, mass incarceration, um, if, we, if we move aside victories like President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama and, and um, um, certain victories like that, uh, the masses of African Americans are really suffering. So what do we say about the relationship where in the 60s and 70s, we had this broad-based relationship where we talked about freedom and indigenous liberation, pan-Africanism, right? But then when we, when we look, at, when, we, when we unpeel layers, we see that we face um, corruption at times in both Africa, but also in African-American circles, whether that's political corruption, whether it's people, um, we, we see what's going on with uh, Colin Kaepernick and, and deals with the NFL and all these different things happening. What do, we, what do we see about the complexity of that relationship? When we, it, it's, it's not as easy as um, up you mighty race, uh, accomplish what you will in terms of Marcus Garvey. So what do we say about that? Professor Vincent and then Professor Brown. Right, it's harder. So really the anti-apartheid movement in this country was, was a high point of recognizing what white supremacy looked like in the extreme. I know growing up in 1980s Los Angeles, I saw the similarities to a type of what I thought was a type of police occupation uh, to in South Central Los Angeles to what I was seeing in the townships of South Africa when I turned on the news. It's easier to make that connection. It's a bit harder to focus on, let's say, things that happened in Nigeria in the early 1990s and to figure out exactly what's going on here because all the actors are black. Right? And it's, it's harder to piece out. And so our Pan-Africanism now has to be still color conscious, but also look at these complexities of dynamics, right? That there are actors in the world who are, that look like us that are not doing, right, for all of us. So we have to be a bit more nuanced and a bit more sophisticated as we look at the shape-shifting of white supremacy, some of the impact of it, but also the complicity of black peoples Absolutely. in some of these dynamics as well. Absolutely. And, and to piggyback on that, um, we are human beings, and not only are we always for 400 years and beyond trying to prove our humanity, we have the foibles of human beings. We have the same faults of a human being. And so we can least afford the selfishness, the classism. We can least afford some of these foibles, and we must understand when they gun down a black person in the street, shooting them in the back, they're not asking them whether or not they have a green card, a passport, or they're a citizen. They're dead on the street like Michael Brown and so many others we've seen. We need to understand that we are all under the gun and come together, not just based on oppression, because 1619 marks our history of commemoration, but there were Africans in the North American region prior to this Absolutely. time period. Absolutely. So we have been going through this struggle for not just 400 years, but probably more like 700. And we need to know by now there are certain things we need to trust one another, we need to trust that there are people who don't like us, and that's what we're going to have to just get over. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand this one last thing, and this one last thing is we need to think generationally, and as we come together as a people, whether or not we're from the African region, Caribbean, or the United States, other people are thinking generationally, mm -hmm. and we need to think generationally. We need to think about what our great-great-grandchildren are going to be able to do, mm -hmm. and if we come together like that, as humans, we all love our mothers. We're all human beings, and if we think generationally, it doesn't matter what part of the world we come from, we can see with a true vision how we can be better in this world, the one we have right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we are going to take questions from our audience. So thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm Calvin Pierce and founder of Project 1619. My, my question to you is that when this commemoration is over on Monday, where do we go from here? Because I'm seeing that there is a larger racial divide in our city and in our nation today of the things of the past two years. But what do we leave behind and where do we go from there? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I'm just going to frame it by um, 
really amplifying one of the points that Professor Brown Marshall said about classism and these foibles or these complexities in our own community. Uh, that racial divide is connected to unequal power relations um, both within and across the racial uh, racial lines. So b both between blacks and whites and Latinos, but also within those groups too. So how can we um, talk and discuss that? Because even when we think about um, uh, President Barack Obama and, and um, um, progressive politics, not all black people necessarily benefited from those either. Yeah. We, we have black people generationally who are impoverished. W what, what, can we, what can we do post this conversation to try to transform that. Dean, let's start with you. So here at Norfolk State University, one of the things that I'm hoping that we will continue to do is to educate future leaders, to get them out there with an understanding that we have, because we're grounded in all aspects of African peoples and the African diaspora, the history, the culture, the sociology, the health, all of that and we're helping to train our students to understand that they have to step up and take leadership positions and not just look at a position as something that they're occupying but rather they're like race men and race women of the of the latter part of the 19th and early 20th centuries their responsibility is to their broader community that they must leave that door open and ensure that other people follow them who look like them so that they're no longer at a boardroom and they're the only African Americans in that room they have to make sure that that room is not just one or two but at least half that they are representing many different voices in the community not just theirs not just the voice over here or the voice over there that's one of the things the other thing is education is critical if you don't know what can happen how you can make a change then you can't make a change and so there are grassroots groups made up of leaders who aren't out there trying to make money for themselves, but they're trying to change their communities and change the world. They're trying to make sure that agencies that have billion dollars, billion dollar endowments, that they put that money into the communities and change those communities. Thank you. I'm a freshman here in the Honors College of Norfolk State, and I have a question, well, more of a, well, yes, question. Um, so before I got here, I went to a high school in Newport News, Virginia, and my teacher told me, you are very bright, do not surround yourself around people who look like you. I took that very offensively, and I wanted to know you guys' opinion, and if you had any advice for me. Okay, we're going to, to get as many questions as possible, we're going to just have one person do each one. Mm -hmm. Professor Brown Marshall. Okay, as I said before, divide and conquer has been used many times. What we need to understand is by the year 2045, this country will be majority people of color. And what we see right now, the nationalism that was brought to the fore, um, is going to be more people trying to undermine the confidence of young folks, people trying to suppress the vote, the Supreme Court being packed with other people who are going to make our lives as miserable as possible. Mm -hmm. We are fighting in a ground war, an intellectual war, a social war, an economic war, and a political one. And I think we need to understand this young person is part of the collateral damage. Unless we get ourselves together and understand that we are in a situation in which people of African descent, no matter where you come from, are still being undermined as far as our progress goes. And we need to think about her and generations into the future. How do we see ourselves generationally so that we don't have another incident like that and a person with this much to go as far as her intellect is not going to be sent out in the world thinking there's something wrong with her because she's of African descent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Young lady, Thank you. young lady, you, you, you surround yourself you surround yourself with people who affirm you and love you and care for you and see you for all the inner and outer beauty that you have. You surround yourself with those people. Those are the people you walk with in the world. They will sustain you. You will help sustain them. That's what you do. Absolutely. Thank you. Next question. One question. I was just 
taking in what the young lady before me had uh, said. I have uh, nine grandkids, and uh, it's a beautiful thing as far as knowledge and guidance and stuff like that. So I was absorbing, absorbing that for myself, for my grandkids. And that was going to be my question. What's next for my grandkids? Uh, let me start. My name is Al Murphy. I'm a 1985 graduate of Norfolk State University. <laughs> State Department, a former uh, television producer for Voice of America for 16 years. And um, for me, just growing up, I was the last one in our family to pick cotton for money. Um, I was raised about an hour away uh, in North Carolina. And I've seen, like, you know, Ku Klux Klan being stopped by them and, you know, a lot of bad things, but it's also a lot of good people. Uh, traveled to over 40 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa in my career. And you get to find out people as far as what's in their heart were more alike than different. And that's what I've learned as far as over the uh, 30 some years as far as uh, being a television producer and a U.S. diplomat. But my thing is that we need each other. And it can start right now. You know, that's my thinking. So, do, do you have you a know, question? My so, question yes. is, uh, like I said in the beginning, I have nine grandkids, yeah. mm -hmm. six boys from 17, 15, on down to uh, three and two. And when I'm driving in my car in the road, and I get pulled over by the police, mm -hmm. and my grandsons or grandchildren are in the car with me, I have to tell them, you know, you need to have your license right here next to you. Don't be fumbling around because you can get shot or, you know, something bad could happen to you as far as the mentality. But my, my question is, you know, deals with generation. Okay. You know, as far as uh, educating one another. And my question deals with what do we tell our grand people? What do I tell our youth as far as how does it start right now and working together? Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll start, Superintendent. Superintendent, I'll start with you. Well, I'm okay. here. And then we'll get another. I don't know. I, it's, it's very, very sad. Um, but I think, you know, I, I work in a national park and I can judge America by who comes through the gate. Um, and there are 419 units within our agency, and I've been to about 51 of them. And there's black feet experiences and our resources in all those units. I think, you know, there's a wide swath of people who believe that they're enlightened. They believe in racial equality. <coughs> they, I don't know, they, they, they create these policies that are really hard for us. And it circles back to what I said in the beginning where we have to create legacies for our communities. See, I'm more interested in what freedom looks like. Like if you pull me over erroneously, I have the means and resources to deal with that. I graduate from college with no debt because my parents put money in a 529 plan and with money left over to buy some assets. I'm very interested in what freedoms look like. So it's about self-improvement, community improvement. Uh, I'm going to be a negative person here, but I feel like we've been talking about education for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we keep having these circular conversations about improving the education system. There's a wide swath of people that have no clue about who we are. They don't even think we're human. Yeah. Right? So we got to work on ourselves. and. Hopefully, somewhere down the line, that fixes some of these little issues that we run into all the time. Racism is always going to be around, but we have to fix our house. Next, next question. I'm going to, I'm going to let, I want to get as many people as possible. Yes. My name is Reverend Josephine Osborne, and I'm a proud 71, 1971 graduate of the Green and Go, the Mighty Green and Go. <laughs> After I graduated, I decided to go into the School of Theology and another school uh, in Richmond, where I live, Virginia Union. So I understand what you were talking about, about the, where we've come with so very little. Uh, during that time, both schools, I ran into a lot of people that helped to shape my life in terms
terms of their spiritual uh, following. They weren't Christians. Later, as I went into theology, I understood that the Christian route, many of them were forced to be Christian because they would bring in more money. Uh, I you, think about all the people that have made me rich. Do, do you have a so question? I want to know. Yes. I'm leading up to okay. it. Okay. I, I just want to get as many people as possible. I want to know. Yeah. Speak to the way we were separated from our na native uh, African spiritual and cultural uh, expression, um, making it evil to believe what we believe and practice what we practice, and making Christianity the um, the right or the most righteous. Uh, what it has done to us both culturally and what it's done to us okay. Thank you. by ourselves. Dr. Amy, do you want to well, I think one of the powers of black studies, right, is that it's a space not only in the university, but also in the community, because black studies is everywhere, right? We need to be more than just in the universities, but it is in K through 12. I've taught in K through 12. I know there's things in Philadelphia that are happening in the high schools. We just got an ethnic studies requirement that's being passed. So the beautiful thing about ethnic studies and black studies is it's just, it's not just education, but it's also movement. and talking about actually taking action, right? So one of the places that you can really explore different African religions and spiritual systems is in black studies, right? I've taught units in like sixth grade that dealt with um, Vodun, which dealt with Santeria, right? So this idea that black studies is such an avenue for everyone to learn, black students, black people, but also non-black individuals as well, to learn about these amazing religions that if you really look at Christianity today and different forms of religion and spiritual systems here in America today, black people still practice this stuff. The baptism is just a water ritual, right? When you think about these things. So when you start to pull these connections and say, well, wait, that's really African. That's, that's part of this, right? That's part of that. There's so much more commonalities. Like, that's your religion? Oh, that's what I do too, right? So I think one of the things is, is um, education can help to dispel some of these these mis miscommunications and misunderstandings about different African religions, but it also is like that extra step, like go and learn something about it, go to a Santeria ceremony, go to a Vodun a, a gathering, right, to learn more about it because it's so empowering. Okay, we'll stop yeah? right there, thank you. <laughs> Next question. Good afternoon, my name is Violet, I'm from Zambia. Um, I was really curious about what it looks like to make more diverse tables. Um, when I went to college in the Midwest, I think um, not only through my internships, I was the only African in the room, but also the only female in the room. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious uh, what the panel thinks about how do we encourage more businesses, more <coughs> churches, more yeah, uh, organizations that serve people to encourage more diversity, not, not only ethnicity, but also um, background as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give that to Dr. Vincent, but as moderator's prerogative, I'm going to say one of the things that we don't do nationally anymore is talk about black equality. Mm -hmm. So we talk about diversity, we talk about multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. These are all myths. These are all fantasies. I, I live in Austin, Texas, where people say it's diverse and there are no black people there, but they'll say it's diverse because it's non-white people that they're accepting, whether they're from South Asia or China, anywhere but Southside Jamaica, Queens, where I'm, I'm from, right? So part of it is talking about black equality, again, in an anti-black context where even black people aren't bold enough and courageous enough to talk about black equality. Black equality is the common denominator for social justice and citizenship for everybody, for everybody. We, we've opened it up for everybody, but we refuse to talk about it. And if we talk about diversity and, and, and multiculturalism, when we're not in the room, and they say, this is a great diverse picture, it's a diverse university, and I'm wondering, where are the black people? There's a huge problem, Dr. Vincent. Mm -hmm. yeah. nice. well. <laughs> That's a tough act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what I would say, this idea of diversity, we do need to broaden out. And when we talk about uh, Pan-African movements, for instance, mm -hmm. Black Power, Marcus Garvey, etc., one of the weaknesses of the movement has been uh, the masculinist dynamic, um, not allowing women, women to come to the fore at the center. 
One of the dynamics of Black Lives Matter, this movement now, is that it's led by black women, Absolutely. queer black women, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a diversity in gender and sexual orientation. There's a broader space when we talk about diversity. I think our politics going forward, the question, where do we go from here, is a politics that is all-inclusive and that moves us all forward and that we look for spaces and create spaces that are diverse in every sense of the word because that's what our nation is and that's how we move forward i think going forward from here yeah but that, that, we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wrap, wrap that up right now because we're really um at the close i think i think that's a great summation um uh, i think this this conversation uh, is about citizenship and black people have been at the cutting edge historically of transforming and expanding American democracy and giving and giving black people that do is very very important I think what Black Lives Matter has done like Professor Vincent has said is really place black women and queer folks LGBTQ at the center of these conversations and making a very similar parallel argument to what black people did in the 19th and early 20th century saying that if black people got and achieved citizenship it would reverberate to everyone i'm talking about native americans people who are physically and mentally challenged people who are on the margins of society but what we did is that we marginalized people within our own community especially black women so what black feminism teaches us and we've got these great uh, teachers like Sonia Sanchez, we've got Angela Davis, we've got all these, 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 uh, and these brilliant black women here. What, what it teaches us is how black people's particular story can be universal. Sometimes people are saying, why are we always focused on black stuff? Well, the reason we're so focused on black stuff is because black people are human beings in a society, America, that has historically tried to dehumanize us and demonize us, right? That's why we're so focused on the black stuff. And so if you talk about black citizenship, it means we're not excluding anybody. But when you don't talk specifically about black citizenship, guess what? We will be excluded historically. So you have to, have to, have to talk about black citizenship. Always, anywhere. Amen. Okay, so <laughs> this has been a great conversation. Um, when we think about 1619 to 2019, uh, the, the four centuries that we've been talking about is really what is at the core of American democracy. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists um, here who, who've uh, contributed their knowledge and their passion. I want to thank the audience, and the audience can give themselves a, uh, a round of applause here. Um, I want to thank, thank uh, Brown Memorial Hall Theater at Norfolk State University for being a part of this, um, as well as Virginia Governor Ralph Northam, uh, Governor Justin Fairfax, Ghanaian Ambassador uh, Barfour um, Bewa, and those here representing the Embassy of Angola, um, and also Voices of America for doing this. This has been so brilliant that Voices of America does this. We can talk about um, justice. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said that uh, uh, justice was what love looked like in public. And I think these conversations are, are just that. Uh, I implore everybody who's, who's watching to keep these conversations going. Uh, encourage your teachers and professors to have more discussions about this. What we talked about today is, is our national and really global American story. Don't let anyone tell you that slavery is not at the core of who we are. Don't let anybody tell you that the black freedom struggle is not central to American democracy and global, global democracy. We are all going to rise and fall together, but those who have taken and traversed the journey from slavery to freedom are at the core and at the forefront of a, of a, visionary, um, uh, a visionary dream uh, for social justice and citizenship for all of us. I leave you with a quote from the late American poet Maya Angelou. For Africa to me is more than a glamorous fact. It is a historical truth. No man can know where he is going unless he knows exactly where he has been and exactly how he arrived at his present place. The Voice of America in Norfolk State University, I'm Peniel Joseph. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.